Hey guys, we're back. This time we're taking a look at Gloomhaven. I did an unboxing for this a little while ago and finally got a chance to sit down and play it. And we're going to get in and show you what it's all about and then I'll give you my thoughts at the end. Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion is a cooperative fantasy campaign adventure where you're playing one of these characters and you're working together to achieve certain mission goals throughout the course of the campaign. Along the way, your character will level up. You'll get new cards and abilities to use in combat, as well as collecting treasure and other items that you find along the way. Jaws of the Lion takes the Gloomhaven game and breaks it down into very simple, easy to understand and teach rules. The campaign book is actually also doubles as the map, which makes setup super easy. You flip to the page you want, everything is ready to go. They change the way that the monsters appear on the map into this nice flag where you have these bars, the top bar, middle bar, and bottom bar, re referring to two-player, three-player, or four-player games, so you know how to set up your miniatures. Makes it super easy. There's markings on the map for the player spawns, again, making it super easy, and also um, obstructions. Uh, barricades, things like that, all appear on the map as do traps and things like that. Throughout the course of the game, you're going to play two cards from your hand, and you're going to take the top half of one, the bottom half of the other. You can go either way, however you want to do it. The initiative of the card here is the order that you're going to play in. The initiative thing's kind of weird because you're going to take two cards and you're going to place them face down in front of you. Then everybody's done that. You flip them over. I have a 17. You're going to go through and figure out what everybody's initiative is that's currently in the game. And then you're going to adjust these little tiny tokens. They're kind of fiddly and very small. But you're going to adjust them in order of who's going where. So in this case, our hatchet has a 17. We're probably going to be towards the top. And then... You resolve a turn in order here. You're going to be doing your movement, which is generally found on the bottom of the cards, and attacks, which are generally on the top of the cards. That's not always the case. They mix and match, but just to give you an idea, so you're going to be moving about this hex grid, attacking the monsters. The neat thing is there's no dice involved. Your cards have a preset attack value. So in this case, you have an attack of six at range three. So you're going to count three spaces. He's in range three. You're going to hit him for six. You flip over the first card. It's minus one, so you only hit him for five. There's also critical hits in here. Uh, there's critical misses. And you can also get blessings, which give you double damage, as well as curses, which give you an automatic miss. Those get to be added into your deck as you level up along the way. You can also remove or add cards to this deck that are going to increase or decrease your chances of things. And you kind of modify it around as needed. You keep track of your health and experience on these dials. I'm not huge on these because some of them, this one seems okay, but some of them are kind of loose and they tend to get bumped. But your XP is the blue. Your health is in the red. I might just go with dice or something else, tokens to keep track of that. It seems like it would be easier in the long run, though. And take up less room. These are kind of big. They give you this nifty token tray to put all of your tokens in, although they just fit. Like, these uh, debris markers here are filled right to the top. So if you just throw them in like the instruction book says, they won't fit. You literally have to go through and stack them up. Same with the coins. They need to be kind of stacked. And uh, could have been slightly bigger, but then it would have had trouble fitting in the box. So I see what they did there. But it uh, does help for your tokens. Then for all your monsters, they give you these cool bags to keep them in. And you put your monster tiles in here along with the attack cards for them. And that's another cool feature to this game is that in the beginning, you're just... The monsters do a specific number of damage, which is based on their stat card here. In this, you can see 
These over here are white based guys. They do one, uh, move one, attack two, five hit points. These over here are the yellow based guys. Why they didn't color the side yellow just to match up or make the bases brown, I don't know. But they have 10 hit points, move one, and attack for two. And then as you do damage to them, you're going to put the damage on these on the corresponding number, corresponding to the number on the standee. Wish those numbers were a little bit bigger. They're kind of hard to see from across the board, and you're really squinting a lot for those. But then as you go through um, scenarios, you get to the point where instead of doing just a generic attack, now they're doing, and I draw the one that has just the generic attack on it. So now they're going to push a guy as they move around and make a ranged attack. And so these change, and then they have these basic ones for your starting games. And then once you get into it further, you're going to start using these more advanced ones. And they have all sorts of things they can do in here. This also changes their initiative. So I really like that feature. And they do have decks of these for all of the different creatures in the game. And those go in the little bag along with the initiative token for the specified creature. And then all the standees go in there too. The drawback is where to put them when you're done. They all kind of just fit in here if you squeeze them in. But definitely need a different storage solution for this. Because the actual monster cards and stuff are underneath. So you got to remove all of these to get to those when you're setting up your game. But again, as the game progresses, they keep adding more and more to it. You start learning about the blessings and curses. You start learning about the um, ways that you can upgrade your deck over time. As you're going up, you start getting cards that make use of these tiny little uh, tokens that pertain to your specific character. In the case of Hatchet, he has one where you can throw a... Um, hatchet at a guy's lucky one and then he has to go get it in order to be able to use it again. There's also cards that uh, I don't know if he has any. I don't have any yet. There's also cards that have like a little track and you have to put one of these on it and they move across each turn triggering new things as they go. Eventually you get to the element chart and you're going to have these element tokens here and they start on the waning side. Whenever you use a card with an element ability, at the end of your turn they go over here and then each round they go down one until they're back to normal. When they're in the waning or strong section, they can be consumed by some abilities to give added bonuses to those abilities. It's kind of a neat feature, but this gets overlooked a lot. Maybe it's just us since we're just starting out, but it's something we tend to give this to the Void Warden to keep an eye on because the rest of us are busy with other stuff and tend to forget a lot. And then finally, you add in these cool battle goals, which are kind of like achievements, I guess is the best way to put it. And they all have a requirement down here and you get two of these at the beginning of a mission you get to pick one and you keep them secret and these are your, like secret objectives you're trying to get over the course of the mission and on your character sheet over here you're going to check these off every time you complete them as you complete um, three you get a free perk up here which you also get when you go up levels and these are what allow you to customize the combat deck here. And there's all sorts of options on there. Kind of interesting, though I find some of these to be kind of detrimental to the party. So, in order to achieve the objectives on here, you might have to do something that might screw over the mission. And then you have this map that you're going to fill in as you explore. I don't think I'm giving anything away here because these are all part of the tutorial, but as you explore these locations, they get added to the map, and these are where different scenarios take place, and they're all numbered on there as well. And 
that's kind of how you're keeping track of where you're moving around. Most of this game seems to take place in the city itself. You also have these event cards that you're going to get for each, in between each scenario. And they have a little text at the top with some multiple choice at the bottom. On the back are the uh, choices that you get to make and the results of making those choices. And they've been a very interesting thing to add in so far. You also have a store of items. And these get added to throughout the course of the campaign. And there's going to be more and more things in here to choose from. There's armor and weapons and odds and ends, potions. Lots of cool things to choose between. And that's just a quick overview, basically, of what you're going to be doing throughout the course of the game. So my thoughts on the game, I really love the uh, combat system where you have all of your options available to you and then over the course of time you're playing combos of cards so they're no longer in your hand and eventually you get to the point where you have to permanently lose an ability the rest of the game to pick back, the, pick back up the rest of your hand and you can do a short rest and have that card picked at random but continue to go or the long rest which takes an entire turn but you're getting to choose the card that you lose there's also cards like this that when you use this ability are lost so you really have to do this hand management thing to um, manage the abilities that you have available for the scenario that you're playing you may want to lead off with a really big powerful ability but at the same time, you lose that card, and once it's gone, you can't use it again for the scenario. So you really have to think about, well, is it the best time to use that? Maybe I should hold back and uh, just kind of move my way around, angle myself better so that I'm better next turn. Or if you're not paying attention, you can use like this. If I use this for a movement three, well, now I can't use this range three attack six up here. Maybe I want that range 3 later, so I go through and find a um, another card with a different move so that I could use this move here to move and then use that attack later on and so on. So you're constantly choosing what you want. Like I've used the heal card many times for the move ability only to get smacked by something in the next turn and be like, it's going to be three or four turns before I get that back and I can heal myself. And things like that happen. So you really have to think about the choices that you're making as you're picking your different abilities. And the um, initiatives matter too. Like if I've got these two cards in my hand and these are what I want to play, no matter what, I'm going in the 60s for initiative. But if I can combine one of those 60 cards with, say, a 17 and get what I want, I can do the powerful abilities on the 64 initiative card at an initiative 17 by combining those. So sometimes you want to break up those big number cards, and that's something else you need to keep into consideration. And I really like the way that that goes and the way that the whole combat in general goes. Combat having the modifier deck here instead of dice rolls is a very interesting and kind of unique idea. I don't think I can think of any other game that uses a similar system, but I love the way that that works. The uh, ability cards for the NPCs making their monsters basically do different things every turn makes them feel more alive almost like there's a dm type person playing those characters because the way that they function changes from turn to turn they can be doing ranged attack one turn decide to drop their weapons and charge you the next turn and that's kind of a cool change and uh addition to the game as i mentioned i'm not a huge fan of these i like the battle goals but i don't like the way that some of them kind of uh force you into situations you wouldn't normally put yourself in just trying to get those checks to get those extra perks i will say that the positive my, my biggest positive of the game is the learn to play guide and how it starts you out with these basic i think there's five scenarios and each one of them adds a couple new rules so they they talk to you about start at the beginning here 
they talk to you about basic setup and stuff here. But then there's a couple pages about actually how to play and how each of the different rules functions. And then you go, okay, play that scenario. That scenario is done. We move on to scenario two. Here's how you set that up. Here's the new things we're introducing. Money, traps, doors, treasure. And this is how you're going to use them. And then it goes through rules. Okay, scenario two is done. Then you get into the next one. These are what we're going to be introducing now. Difficult terrain. And um, section breaks where there's parts of the story to add on. Things like that. New mechanics. And then they go through and they do this for each of the first five missions. Slowly building you up to being able to play the full game. Now the funny part is, while this is probably my favorite part of this game... It is also the worst part of this game. And the reason I say that is because they include this book as well as the glossary book here to cover the rules. There is no actual rule book here. So later on when you want to reference something, you need to basically go back through this tutorial guide. Remember which one of those five missions they covered that at rule. Now, most of the rules are in the glossary, and they're in alphabetical order for easy lookup. But maybe you don't remember the exact term that you're looking for to try to look up. Or there are quite a few things that are not covered in here that are covered in this book. So you need to go back through and find where they taught you. The other problem is some of the rules, not very many, are different than the base Gloomhaven. So if you've watched any how to plays on Gloomhaven or read through the rules of that or are familiar with that, they don't necessarily apply to this, especially when you're doing the training missions. That's a whole other story. But um, some things have changed slightly, so you can't rely on things you already know when playing this game because they might be slightly different. So there's that. But yeah, having an actual rule book to uh, complement these two would be great. I do like the glossary and the way that everything is alphabetized, but there's a lot of missing material in here, and I'm not sure why that is. So it's kind of strange that they did it that way. But I do like the way that this eases you into the rules and introduces them. I just wish we had a rule book itself that we could look at, especially after you finish the scenario and you're playing, maybe you stop playing for a little while, you come back to playing, you want a quick refresher. I like to flip through rule books every now and then, especially before I'm playing the game with new people or after a long break, so that I can at least myself be refreshed on what the rules are and help the newer people. And you can't really do that with this game the way it's set up. I do like that they went out of their way above and beyond to build an insert to hold the base game material. But at the same time, they gave you all these baggies and things to store everything and separate them, which is great. But at the same time, once you get everything ready, it really doesn't fit in the box anymore. Somebody told me you could, and this is the best way I found to do it. But even then when you're doing it, like the, these boards sit here, which end up sitting at a weird angle. I usually put the bag of bases under here. There's, there's not really a way to package everything back in the box neatly. I've done it the best I could, and I'll show that at the end here. But despite the flaws, everything about this game I've loved so far. My group loves it. We're even looking into buying the big box of Gloomhaven now. Once we get a little bit farther along in the campaign here. The fact that these standees are cardboard but the models are plastic kind of bothers some people. I'm okay with it. My big concern is that removing and adding these miniatures to these little pressure bases over time might deteriorate the cardboard. I'm curious to see how they hold up. Anybody out there who's had the original Gloomhaven for years let me know how well they last. Any other little complaint I have that's very minor is some of the fiddly bits are very small, especially these, because you're using these constantly. They are very tiny and next to impossible to read for the person. If you got them over here, the person that's over in this corner of the table can't, it really can't see those unless he gets up and leans over. You're constantly asking each other, all right, what was the order again? I know I'm in the middle somewhere. 
And I like the initiative system. I like that they gave you these to keep track of it. I just think it could have been done a better way. And I'm going to look into seeing if we can find something for that. In the end, though, it's an amazing game, and we've had a blast with it so far. I am super glad that I picked this one up, and uh, kind of disappointed I waited as long as I did to do it. I am glad that I picked up Jaws of the Lion before the standard Gloomhaven. I think this is the way to go if you want to learn how to play Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven, the original, just kind of throws you in, and you have to learn everything from that 50-plus page rulebook, where this eases you in over a course of five scenarios, each one adding a couple new rules to get you into uh, the swing of things. My least favorite thing about the game has to be the element board and the whole um, moving the tokens around to keep track of it. It seems like just an extra busy work thing to do. And I've heard there's an app that'll keep track of this stuff for you, but I haven't actually tried it, but uh, that is probably the most or least uh, favorite thing about the game. Keeping track of it, it ends up getting forgotten, and um, we don't really remember it until somebody plays an ability that can use one of the elements. I don't think I have one in my deck yet. There we go. I have one here that can use an ability, and then you look over and you're like, did anybody use that? Because we never moved the tokens for the last, like, four turns. And uh, it's just something weird to keep track of. Maybe it'll get easier as time goes on, but for now, that's probably my biggest complaint about the game. The other minor complaint that's easily fixed is that despite the fact that it's a completely co-op game, you either win or lose the scenarios together, you're fighting for money, and you compete for it. Every time a monster dies, in the later scenarios anyway, doesn't during the tutorial, but every time a monster dies, they leave behind coins. And it's a race to see who can get over to them and pick the coins up and add them to their stash, which is what you use to buy things later on. Also, once they start introducing treasure chests, there's treasure chests in the game, but these chests only have uh, a specific item in them depending on the scenario, and once you've looted that item, it's gone for good. And certain ones are only available in certain missions and so on, so it becomes a race during the fight to get over and take the chest. And what ends up happening is you'll have a bunch of the party over here fighting monsters and clearing a path while somebody sneaks around and goes over here and steals the chest. And even though you're supposed to be working together, it just feels wrong to be competing over treasure. And an easy house rule that I saw online that we may, we haven't done it yet, but we may implement in ours, is that at the end of the scenario, everybody pools together what was got earned and we divide it up evenly. So that's something we're possibly looking at. It's just how we've always played D&D &D and things like that. So kind of feels fitting for this. Overall, though, this game has pretty much replaced D&D, &D, at least for us, as you can still role-play the characters. There are only four in the base game here, and until you move on to the Big Daddy Gloomhaven, and you get, I think there's 17 in there, you're stuck with those four to choose from. But so far, we've all fit into our rules. We like our characters, and there's a little bit of role-play that goes on. Limited amount, but... Uh, it has added fun to our games, and I look forward to playing it more. The original idea when we got the game was to play it once a month and place of our old D&D &D campaign that kind of fell apart. And since we've got it, the guys have wanted to play every chance possible. So it's gone from being a once a month thing to multiple times a week thing. And I'm okay with that for now. I don't know if I'm going to get burnt out on it eventually, but so far it's been fun, it's been entertaining, and we're moving along, progressing well, and it looks like it's uh, definitely going to be around for a while in our collection. Oh, and I forgot to show how I put things back in here, at least for me. Somebody can tell me if I'm doing this wrong, but put everything back where it originally went. These I had to stack on their side to make them fit in nice and neat. 
the bases so in this little insert here these go here they were originally supposed to go all the way across but they don't stack in there properly because um, these stick up and then you have this tray that goes in here but again it sticks up because it's sitting on all the baggies and then your board and all your books go on top I have found it came shipped that way too if you flip one of these spiral rings over so the rings aren't on top of each other it helps and then the rule books on top And it does actually shut somewhat. It sticks up just a little bit in the one corner. Anyway, my thoughts on Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. Definitely a thumbs up and a keeper. I'm glad I added this to our collection. And as always, I uh, can't wait for our next game so we can play again. Anyway, I hope that helps you uh, decide if it's something you might be interested in or not. Feel free to leave comments down below. As always, thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.